this is a passage that I don't come to lightly. This passage that we're about to read and study, to me, is a microcosm of the entire life and ministry of Jesus. Everything I read about from cover to cover in the Gospels about what Jesus did for me, I can see hints and um, elements of it right here in these verses that we're going to read today. This really is a, a hinge in Luke's account in many ways. So you're in Luke 5. Let me invite you to follow along as we study together here at the First Baptist Church of Westminster in a message that I don't have a title for, but I'll tell you what I'm going to talk about, and that's the authority that Jesus has to forgive and heal. The authority to forgive and heal. I did not say the authority to heal and forgive. I said he has the authority to forgive and heal. Luke chapter number 5, look with me at verse number 17 down through verse 26. And it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy, and they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him, to lay him before Jesus. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop and led him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answering said unto them, What reason ye in your hearts? Whether is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins. He said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy couch and go into thine house, and immediately he rose up before him, before them and took up that whereon he lay and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. Lord, I ask for your help through the Holy Spirit this morning. I beg you that you would take your word and do what I cannot do today. I am finite. I am limited. But Lord, you are infinite and you are all powerful. You can take your word and you can help our minds to be settled on who you are. You can help us, Lord, to, 
deal with the wrestlings we might have going on inside of ourselves even today. And you can bring us to a place of peace. Lord, in order to find that, we must come to you by faith. Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief would be my heart today. I want to see you work, Lord. I want to see you move. I want to see you get a hold of hearts and lives. I don't want anyone that is listening to this message today to leave the way they came. I don't want anyone that might be watching to exit from the screen or turn the video off and be the same after what we see in this passage. But Lord, in order for that to happen, you've got to have free course with your word. And I pray for that, Lord. I beg that your Holy Spirit would take your word that there'd be nothing to hinder, nothing in the world, the flesh, or the devil, nothing in ourselves, nothing in me that would stop what you want to accomplish this morning. Lord, there is someone, I'm convinced there is someone that's listening to your word, that's living in bondage right now, and they need to be set free. Lord, there's someone that is wrestling with guilt because of sin in their life, and they need to know your forgiveness. Lord, help them to come to this passage and realize that by faith you can forgive them. Help them to understand what that means fully, to be forgiven of their sins. Help them to find the liberty and freedom that comes through you and you alone, I pray, that you'd set someone free this very hour. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Imagine with me maybe a moment in your life when you felt completely helpless. Now, I had to ponder this, and I didn't have to go too far in my own journey. A few weeks ago, I was uh, privileged to travel up to Montana, and I did a beautiful hike. Some of you I've chatted with about it since we came back. I took my boys up there, had a great time. You know, I was glad to have them because they're strapping young men by now. Uh, the tables have turned. When, uh, when they were littler, I was the one, uh, you know, that was the hero carrying all the weight. Now it's like I'm the one that needs help, you know. So uh, you, can, you, can, you, you can pity me for my plight, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm over the hill, they tell me. And that's, that's how they describe, you know, certain ages when you turn, you're over the hill. And, and I'm definitely over the hill. After that hike, I felt it. If you can imagine with me a time in your life, I'm going to tell you about a time in my life, but what about a time in your life when you felt, completely and utterly helpless. Even if you wanted to do something about your situation, you didn't have the strength to, you didn't have the ability to, you were not able to, no matter how you looked at it. Think about that time, okay? Here's the time for me. We're hiking, right? It's beautiful. I got pictures. We hiked in, we went about eight miles in one valley and eight miles out another valley. But here's the problem. In between those two valleys was something called Sundance Pass. Some of you are like, oh, that's not a problem. I could do that in my sleep. Not me. Not me. Um, the, you know, there was a day in time when I might have done it a little better than I did. Uh, but I had a great group that was with me. And I'm so thankful for these, uh, these friends that were there. Okay, they're family. But they, they were friends in that journey. Now, they didn't have to carry me over the pass, okay? So before you're thinking, man, pastor just totally failed on this thing. No, I made it. Okay, I, 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 I did the pass. I was able to get up to the top and over. By the grace of God, I did it. <laughs> but I was definitely the weakest link in our group. You ever been there, you know that, you're like, man, I know I'm the one that's going to be holding everybody up here. And that was the case. Uh, but uh, So we've got our packs on, right? We've got to go in for a few days, so we've got to bring everything with us that we need. Beautiful. I mean, we couldn't have asked for better weather. We go in through the valleys, pretty steady going, just a steady climb, you know, for most of it. There were a few parts where I got a little winded and we would shoot off and go up to see a lake and come back down, kind of a day hike thing. You know, we saw Lake Mary up there. Just beautiful scenery, man. You get back into these areas where it's tranquil. Well, all was going well. And then we come to the river, we cross the bridge, we sit down to regroup and get our strength. And then I look up. And I see about 11,000 plus feet and switchbacks. And some of them, some of these switchbacks, man, I don't know who cut these switchbacks. There are some of those switchbacks that must have been a quarter mile long in themselves. And, you know, I can see the top and it's like, oh, I, could, I could just, you know, as the crow flies, I could just, it, it's right there. I can see it. But then you got to go on the switchbacks. 
And uh, because the altitude where we were and, uh, and just my condition, I, I don't do well when I get up in altitude, I start losing oxygen. And I'm acclimated, you know, living here in Denver, as long as we have, we're a mile high. So it's not like I had to overcome some of the challenges from folks, like if I would have come from Georgia or something like that and have to, you know, come from a different sea level. Uh, that, that's, that's pretty rough when you're, you know, thinking about hitting that. I mean, people get violently ill from altitude sickness. And it, it's a thing, you know, it's, it's a real deal. Well, I didn't have any of that going on, but the up is what really gets me because I just can't get the oxygen and I've got to go and then stop. And it's not because I, I can't carry the weight. It's because I can't breathe. <laughs> Plain and simple. I can't get oxygen flowing through my body and it doesn't work. And so uh, I knew that it was going to take me a while to get over the pass. We got there uh, in time to be able to summit, get over the top because, you know, as close as we are to the mountains, I understand you know, the last thing you want to do is be up on top of a summit somewhere in the afternoon, anywhere in the Rocky Mountains, for crying out loud, because afternoon is like clockwork. Every afternoon, you know, you get thunderstorms and maybe the rain's not so much a concern, but the lightning and stuff. If you're up there with lightning, I mean, you're even closer to all that electricity. I'd like to be, you know, down around something that can deter that away from me a little better, you know. So the last thing I want to do is be that weak link that holds everybody up and then we're stuck at the top of this pass or something and there's a storm that comes through because, you know, I was checking the weather as I went and I knew there was a good chance that if we didn't get down in time, there'd be a storm. So that puts pressure on me as well because I'm thinking, man, I've got to go. I've got to get up this mountain. I've got this pack. I had already shed some of my weight, my boys, and said, let me take this, you know, take this first aid kit. Let me take this from you. And, and so um, I gave them as, you know, what I could within reason, and they're helping me. So my pack was maybe, you know, I try to keep it under 40 pounds anyway. I was, but I was still doing like 35 pounds of a pack going uphill. And uh, I'm being vulnerable to you, okay? I know a lot of you think that I'm Superman. Well, I'm about to just smash all that to smithereens, okay? I'm, I'm as weak and frail as the next person. And uh, I got on that pass, you know, we, we rested at the bottom, we start up those switchbacks, and, uh, you know, because there was four of us, we split up into two buddy groups, and we sent the boys up, because I knew I didn't want to, you know, hold them up. So I said, you guys stay together, you get to the top, and here's what I want you to do. When you get to the top and you've seen the summit, if you have the heart to and the compassion for it, turn around and come back and come help me because I am over the hill. And uh, so we, we started the journey. And uh, my uncle was with me, and, uh, and we started this climb. And so far, so good. We started getting up in altitude. We hit the parts where there's scree. If you don't know what scree is, it's a bunch of broken rock on the side of the mountain that, uh, you know, you have aval avalanches that could rock slides, all that stuff. Well, they have trails, you know, the switchbacks go across all this scree, really loose. You got to watch your footing. I hurt my ankle a little bit getting over that. But I remember getting up <laughs> to certain points of those switchbacks. And I, I even said this to my uncle. I turned around, I was like, ah, I thought the boys would be back down here by now. I'm dying. I mean, I'm like, I'm struggling. Okay, if you could have been up there, you'd have felt really sorry for me. You'd be like, no, let's just turn around. But I'm, I'm determined. I'm, I almost didn't make it. Like, I was wrestling in my heart and mind. I'm like, why am I putting myself through this? I can't even feel my legs anymore. My ankle hurts. Like, I mean, just, you know, pain after pain, excuse after excuse. Why am I still moving forward? Look, hey, there's a nice place right down there. I can just go back down the hill and I'll stay in my tent there until I, you know, decide I want to leave and I'll walk back out the same valley I came in. I don't have to go over this. I almost didn't. And I'm thinking, I'm watching the clock. Like, we're not going to beat the storm. We're not going to make it. I'm going to take so long getting over this that we're going to be stuck up there in the middle of a lightning storm, and then what are we going to do? I, I'm thinking about safety of the other people that are with me and, and myself. And uh, I made it. By the grace of God, I made it. But I remember, you know, in, in that moment, I was, I was thinking, I can't do this. And I got a little emotional at one point because I was, you know, it was, it was one of those dad moments, I guess. I look up on the switchbacks and I see my boys up there and uh, they're sitting down, you know, getting their wind. And I just looked and I, and I thought, you know, those are some great young guys up there. 
And I, I did. I had a little dad moment. <laughs> I'm like, Lord, thank you because that you you did that. I I, I couldn't have done that. Uh, you know, seeing them uh, together and doing that climb and knowing the the kind of boys that they turned out to be. I, I got a little emotional, and probably it had to do with a lot of physical exhaustion and other things that was going on physiologically with me. It was just one of those moments, but. Um, I was really proud of my boys, but I did mean it when I told my uncle. I thought they'd be up there and back down here by now because I'm, I'm like, please come get this back off of me. I can't keep going. And uh, and they did, you know, uh, you know, they got to the top and they they spent a couple of minutes up there and then turned back around, came back on the switchback. Now before you like you know size me up too much, I, I was only about you know, three switch, but I only had three, not quarter mile long switchbacks. I only had, you know, just a few switchbacks, just about three switchbacks to go. And I would have been at the top with my pack, but I was so thankful when I saw, you know, Alex came down the, the switchback came down the trail within, you know, five minutes, he was to me and he said, here, let me help you. And he took my pack. Man, I was walking like I was on air the rest of those three switchbacks to the top. I'm like, where were you like five switchbacks ago, you know? Um, think about a time that you had where it was insurmountable. If I was there by myself, I think I would have given up. I really do. I think I would have said, this isn't worth it. I'm turning around. I can't do this. I I'm a fool. I, I am crazy for even thinking about coming you know, the eight miles into this pass, and then the 11,000 feet over it. But I got to tell you, when I made it to the top, the wind was like blowing me sideways, you know, because it's really windy up there. I took some pictures, and at the summit, you can see both sides, right? I could see the valley I came in and beyond. I could see the valley we were going to go out, September Morn Lake, the other lakes that we were going to go by on our journey out, I could see those because I had a different vantage point. I could see both sides. We come to this passage, and I challenge you with that thought. I give you that story, make myself vulnerable to you, dash all your hopes that I'm Superman, because I want you to think about your own life. And, and that's just something that I can share with you, okay? But there are bigger things than trying to summit something like Sundance Pass. There are things that impact our lives that come, and sometimes we are so helpless. We hit an impasse, and we can't go any further. We can't make it. And we're introduced to a man in our passage here that is in a situation like that. Weighed down with a burden so heavy, it seems impossible to carry this burden alone. It's in these times we often realize how deeply we long for someone to come and step in. I cannot tell you how thankful I was to see Alex come back down that, that trail and to know, hey, it's not going to be long and I can have some of this weight lifted. This is a desire that each of us has when it comes to the burdens in our life. We, we want someone to intervene. We want someone to help us. We want someone who has the ability and can do something about our situation. We want someone that can bring healing. We want someone that can bring forgiveness. Help us find a way out of our troubles. That's what we want. This is universal. I don't know anybody that lives on God's green earth that doesn't come across a juncture like this some point in their life. doesn't matter where you live, where you grow up, what culture you're in, what nation you're from, your background. Everybody comes to a point where they meet the insurmountable. And we're brought to the end of ourselves. Here's a man that has to be at the end of himself. 
This is part of what makes us human, living in a fallen world, in a fallen condition. Everybody's human the last time I checked. If you're a person, you're human. So we come here to the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 5. We have Luke capturing a moment like what I've described to you in my own life, but this is a moment that's a little different. Jesus is teaching. Here he's in the middle of a crowded house. He's surrounded by Pharisees. Uh, Luke calls them doctors of the law. That's a good translation. They're teachers of the law. Uh, He's surrounded with people that have come from everywhere. They've come from all over Galilee, not just Galilee. They're coming now from Judea. They're coming from Jerusalem. And, And you can just sense the atmosphere here is just charged with anticipation, with curiosity. this Jesus' fame has been spreading abroad. Why are they coming from all these places? Because they've heard about this man from Galilee. They've heard about the power of this Jesus of Nazareth to cast out unclean spirits from people, to heal people taken with serious fevers, to... To, to cleanse someone from leprosy and make them clean and, and multiplied over. They're hearing about the ministry of Jesus Christ. They're hearing about this preacher that's opened the Word of God and talked about fulfilled prophecy happening before their very eyes. And so naturally, there's a magnetism in Capernaum. Everybody's gathering around Jesus in anticipation. What's going to happen today? You know, uh, I, I like to keep that kind of energy around church. I, I, I hope that you have that kind of energy in your life. You wake up in the morning, you know, Monday morning comes and you're like, I can't wait to see what God's going to do today. Now, don't get the wrong idea. We need to have a genuine, you know, pursuit of that. We don't want to be like them coming just for the bread, you know, just because we want our bellies full. We want something deeper than that. We want to, we want to go beyond the material But do we not yearn to see God move? What's Jesus going to do next? Who's He going to heal today? What kind of message is He going to bring? What kind of words will Jesus have for us when He teaches today? So we we enter here, and we're presented with this group of men who are absolutely desperate. I cannot read this passage without sensing their desperation. If you're not desperate for Jesus today, friend, you need to get desperate. You need to be desperate like these men are desperate. If you're in a church, a Bible preaching, Bible teaching church, and you're not desperate to get other people to Jesus like these men are desperate to get them to Jesus, then you need a little dose of that desperation. They're desperate. They meet an obstacle, but it doesn't stop them. They are persistent to push through. I mean, what better friends could you ask for than, than these, uh, these four friends that bring them to Jesus? Now, Luke, Luke doesn't give us some of the details that the other gospel writers give us, and he's, he remains silent on some things, and that's important too. I think it allows him to focus more on what he's talked about in the passage, and the other gospel writers have covered some of these details. You know, How do we know specifically Jesus was in Capernaum? Well, you've got to go read Mark to figure out those details. And Mark gives a beautiful uh, account of this story too, by the way. But when you compare them together, you get the fuller picture. Here is this man with his friends, driven by a hope that they have in Jesus. They know the helpless situation of their friend. They can't help him. They can't heal him. He's taken with this palsy. That is a par- that is he's paralyzed. And... Uh, They can't do anything about that situation, but they could do something about his situation in getting him to Jesus. They're motivated by by some kind of hope that if they get get this man to Jesus, Jesus can restore his broken body. Jesus can give him a new chance at life. Jesus is the one who can change this man's life forever. And if they can get him to Jesus... He'll never be the same. That's their hope. But they get to the house, and the house is packed. 
I mean, it's beyond standing room only. Uh, you know, we talk about some of the things with with uh, layouts today, and as a pastor, you have to really think about you know occupancy and all of that. We have city city ordinances, and we have rules and regulations on on uh, public places of gathering, and and if you're over occupancy, you're going to get in trouble. You know, and, and these are good things. I don't want to be negative about it because they protect us. I mean, we remember horrific things. I, I don't because I wasn't there, but I can read about things like the Chicago fire. You know, so I understand a lot of these codes come out of things like that, responses to situations to keep people safe. We want you to be able to come here in this church building and feel as safe as possible to be able to know that things aren't going to fall down on you and all of that. So, you know, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that happens. And, and as I read this story, man, if, if I was like working for the city or something, I'd read this story and be like, how many boxes could I check off here on how many codes they'd be violating? <laughs> it's, a, it's a different day and time. Here's a first century house. I mean, these guys are tearing the roof open. They're, they're doing some demo work on these tiles. They're, uh, what kind of contraption? I mean, hey, I've been to the fire department. Man, these, these guys are on it. And the ladies that work there too, they're on it. Man, we just took a group from our troop over and toured the station right down here, uh, Adams, Adams Fire Station. We went into their bay. Man, they've got this huge bay, and they're like, here, let me show you this truck, and this is a neat truck, but, but, but we want to get through this stuff because I want to show you this stuff over here. And then you look up in the rafters, and they've got all kinds of uh, belay equipment. They've got repelling equipment. They've got all of the gurney stuff you need. They've got everything that, you know, any situation they come into, they should have a tool for that job. I'm sure these guys pulled up with their, you know, utility truck and their gurney, and, and they've got all the right repelling equipment. They've got all the ropes, you know, all the climbing stuff they're going to need to hoist this guy down into the middle through the rope of this. I'm sure they checked the engineering structural capability of what they were hanging these ropes on to let him down. I'm, I'm sure that they, I'm having a little fun with it. But can you just imagine? You got to be desperate to do what these guys are doing. And, and you've got to be motivated by a hope that when you do this, something's going to happen. You might not quite know exactly how it's going to work. But the hope is, the faith is, that if they get this, their friend to Jesus, that he's not going to stay in that bed. That Jesus is going to do something for him. And, and, and their hope really is that he'll heal him and that he will stand, he'll be able to stand up and walk on his own two feet and not face this paralysis anymore in his life. And they're helpless to that, but if they can get him to Jesus, Jesus, Jesus can take care of that because he's done this for this person. He's done this for this person. He's helped this condition. He's helped that. Hey, this guy has the power to do what no other human can do. And he, as Nicodemus said, you must be sent from God because no man can do the miracles you do except to be sent from God. So there's this division over who Jesus is, and we encounter that in the text as well. But they're driven by hope that Jesus can heal him. Audacious. This is audacious. <laughs> can you imagine being in that room? Jesus is teaching, and, and I imagine it got so quiet in there you could hear a pin drop. Everything is silent because all of a sudden, you know, you see little dust coming down and, and these tiles begin to open, and then lo and behold, this guy with his bed, mind you, is being lowered down with his mat, and lowered down right in the middle of all of them, dropped right in front of Jesus. What kind of interruption to a service would that be? <laughs> you know, I don't think we're going to continue the order of service after that, Brother Tim. I think we're just going to hit pause, and everybody's going to be, you know, jaw dropped, mouth open. What's going to happen now? <laughs> this wasn't planned for. But they couldn't get to him otherwise. There were so many people. But they were audacious. Everybody's looking at Jesus. So what does he do? He, um, 
He blows all their expectations out of the water. That's what he does. That's what Jesus does when I read about him. Every time I read something in the Gospels, I'm like, wow, I don't think they expected that. I don't think that's exactly what they were looking for. When Jesus teaches parables, when I listen to Jesus and read his teaching in parables, I'm always looking for that, that gasp moment. Like, oh, he said, what? Yeah, Jesus is about to have one of those moments where he's going to, to just baffle. He's going to, um, he's going to do something completely unexpected, and I'm sure it's going to shock everybody there. <clears throat> because <coughs> they're all, as I mentioned, expecting him to heal this man like he's done all the other times. And Jesus doesn't do that immediately. Now, does the guy get healed? Yes, he does. But Jesus doesn't do that first. Look at it. What did Jesus do first? He saw, he observed, he perceived. Now, let me just pause. I'll try to come back to this thought because I've got to pick that up. But when Jesus saw their faith, that's plural, the faith of the four friends, he saw, he perceived their faith. Note that because he perceived something in these men. As he's teaching, he picks up on something. He sees their faith. Now, I'll come back to that. He also is perceptive of something else that's going on later, and I may not have time to get to it here today, but he perceives the Pharisees and scribes reasoning in themselves. Anytime the Gospel of Luke or the Gospel writers in the life of Christ are talking about people you know, having a reasoning, a dialogue within themselves, it doesn't really work out for that group in the end, usually, when, they're, when, they're, when Jesus confronts them in that. But notice how perceptive He is. This is a perception that goes beyond human ability. It is a supernatural perception because He's God manifest in the flesh. He sees what others miss, not because He's astute, but because He's the Son of God. He understands the dialogue that's unspoken, that's going on, the conversation that these scribes and Pharisees are having in themselves, in their mind about, how could He dare say these things? It also lets you know why they're there, why they're really there. Why did they come from Galilee? Why did they come from Judea? Why did they come from Jerusalem? Why did they come from everywhere? These doctors of the law, these Pharisees, these scribes, it's interesting how Luke describes them in the passage. You look at it and he says, the, uh, the Pharisees and doctors of the law, and then later on he says, the scribes and the Pharisees. He almost like bookends the Pharisees. Like, Well, back to the perception of Jesus. Jesus is unlike anybody else in the sense that he is God. 100% God. 100% God. What do you know about God? Well, the Bible teaches us God has certain attributes. God is omnipotent. God is omniscient. God is omnipresent. He, is, he knows all. Uh, there's nothing that God could, could never not know. Uh, in, in fact, not only does He have to know everything that is, He has to know everything that could be too. I mean, just to think about the omniscience of God blows my mind, my little pea brain mind. God knows all. And here Jesus is perceptive of these men's faith. He saw their faith. He perceived something in them. And He does what nobody was expecting. And you know that because of the reaction of the scribes and the Pharisees. He does what nobody was looking for. He looks at the man. Here's, here's all this work they've gone through. Man, they've torn the roof off to get this guy down to Jesus. They, they've not only done that, back up a little bit, they took him up on the roof to get him down through the roof. And, and, you know, first century houses, they would have flat roofs in this day. They would usually have some kind of stairs outside that you'd be able to get up 
to the roof because they would, they would be able to do things up there on the roof. Uh, the tiles, you know, typically in a first century house like this, maybe we would consider, we would think about some, some wood, uh, mud, you know, the coverings for the tops of these houses. But look at what Luke describes it as. Remember his audience, he's writing to Theophilus, and he's writing to a broader Greek audience. So he uses a specific word. He uses, uh, they removed the tiles because, you know, anybody that's in Greek culture is going to understand, oh, they took the roof open in order to get him down to Jesus. There were tiles up there that they removed. They get him down. They've gone through all this work, and they're like, okay, this is going to be the moment. We're going to get him down in front of Jesus. Jesus is going to heal him. He's going to get up, and he's going to walk out. And that's not what Jesus does. He perceives, he saw their faith. And he says to the man, pay attention to the wording. You've got a good translation. And watch the T's, especially when it says thee, thy. That's singular. So he's not talking to the group here. He sees their faith, plural. But he singles out this man that was brought by his friends, didn't come to Jesus without their help. But moved by their faith, this man also had to believe that Jesus could do it. And he turns to the man, and Luke tells us, he makes a profound statement. He says, man, anthropos, thy sins, singular, the sins that you have, not their sins, not the sins of your friends, not the sins of the scribes and Pharisees, not the sins of everybody that's coming from around Galilee, Judea, Jerusalem, your sins, thy sins, singular, thy sins. Thy sins are, not will be, not were, thy sins right now, this very moment, thy sins are forgiven, not just forgiven, they're forgiven thee. The sins that you have, you're released from those, you, yourself, all your sins, thy sins are forgiven thee. What? <laughs> they went through all this work to get this guy to Jesus, and he looks at him and says, ah, you're forgiven. Well, thanks, <laughs> but I'm still laying on my bed. I'm still laying on my mat. My legs are still paralyzed. I, st I still can't walk. Well, that, that's great and all. Don't miss this. Jesus is going to use something that they can see later. You read the passage. He's going to tell him, but so that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He has the authority. He has the ability to do it. He's sent from God uh, on a mission to redeem the world. He says, this is the purpose that I'm telling this man to arise and walk. He's going to tell him to do that, but he's using the physical. He's using something they can see that he has authority to do in the realm of the seen so that they can know he also has power in the unseen realm in the place where they can't see. You see, if we were to come to this passage and hear Jesus say, man, thy sins be forgiven thee, that ought to be enough for us right there. We ought to be able to just rely on Jesus. The word faith is used, and, and this faith here is not just a, a mere head knowledge, not just an assent that he is you know, the Son of God, not, not just not just knowing those things. This is speaking of a reliance upon Him, a trust on Him. We like to describe it this way, a trust on Him, just like you're trusting that chair you're sitting in to not leave you on the floor. Trusting, faith, that's the sense behind this faith. When He says, man, thy sins are forgiven thee, that kind of absolution, that, that ought to be enough for us to know that Jesus can do in the spiritual realm. But Jesus here has a confrontation that Luke tells us about. Confrontation with the Pharisees. That's why I say this is kind of a microcosm, really, of the entire uh, life of Christ from beginning to end. But here, Jesus shows us something in addressing this man, in verse number 20, he says, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. This is the turning point in the entire story. This statement. 
is the turning point. This is the moment where everything truly changes for this man. The turning point was not when Jesus told him, rise, take up thy couch, and go to your house. And he did so immediately, uh, no questions asked, you know, immediately, just like the, the, the guy with leprosy we saw before, immediately Jesus tells him to do this, commands him, and he does. And he goes through this, and Luke describes it in rapid fashion so that we know it was immediate. The guy just obeyed. And then he glorified God on the way to his house so that the scribes and the Pharisees would know that Jesus was sent from God, that he has authority. So back, back to this moment where in verse 20 he says, Thy sins are forgiven thee. This is the turning point. This is the moment where everything changes. The crowd that's there, they gathered expecting a physical healing. But Jesus, you have to see this, Jesus addresses something that is so much deeper. Jesus doesn't remedy the presenting problem. Jesus doesn't treat the symptoms. Jesus goes right to the source. Right to the source. That piece of information right there, if you can really understand that, that will unlock why Christians are the way we are. That will unlock why we believe God the way we do. That will unlock why we take a position in the world and have a worldview that drives us to want to live more like the one who saved us. He saved us to forgive us from our sins. Now that's easy to say. What in the world does that mean? This man wasn't forgiven of anything other than his sins, but this man specifically was forgiven of his sins. Psychology will tell you about forgiveness, that we can have forgiveness one with another, we can remedy you know, uh, grievances between ourselves, but what psychology will, will not give you the solution for, these are all presenting problems. What psychology will never drive you towards is the actual root of it all to deal with what the Bible teaches as the core issue that has plagued humanity since Genesis chapter 3, the fall. Now, for us today, if we understand the Bible, we, we understand that. For the scribes and Pharisees, they've got that figured out as well. Here they are in the passage. And they're doctors of the law. Hey, they know the, the Word of God inside and out. To them were committed the oracles of God. They're the Israelites. They've had the truth of where we came from and how the fall happened. They've had the story of Abraham. They've had all the stories of the Old Testament that have shown them the failure of Israel, the failure of Israel, and, and then the judgment that Israel went in. They've also lived through the Maccabean Revolt. They've also lived through the Hasmonean Dynasty. These are in between the Testaments, in between the Old and New Testament, so that period of 400 years of silence when God didn't speak. They lived through that. They had their, their, uh, their way of life threatened by Rome. They understand what it means to want to hold on to your history and heritage to remain Jewish in the sense of, of the Pharisees. That's why they held on to these oral traditions that went outside of the Bible. They had taken the teachings of God and made them so specific, adding to things and specifying things. You have to understand the burden of the Pharisees upon the people that have all gathered. So here you have an everyday person coming from Galilee, and then in the same house you have the scribes and the Pharisees. Okay. <laughs> this is, to me, this is almost like a tribunal for Jesus. Okay, I, I was really intimidated. What I knew I was going to have to go down to the school, and I was going to have to go before the doctoral committee, and I'm going to have to actually defend the work that I worked on for the past seven years, and now I've got to sit before them, and they're going to scrutinize me. They're going to ask me questions. They're going to grill me. These doctors of the law are there for a purpose. They've heard about this man Jesus, and they're coming to check up on him. 
What's this guy teaching? We have this rogue preacher over here in Galilee, and he's doing these things that are attracting all this attention. We need to go check this guy out. And I mean, you've got the higher ups there. This isn't just an everyday kind of occurrence. Luke draws this story out on purpose because the Pharisees and the doctors of the law are there. Okay, this would be like you going before the Supreme Court or something, all right? Like you're getting, you're getting scrutinized to the nth degree because of their knowledge, not only of, of, of the things God did reveal that we have in the Old Testament, but their knowledge of all the other ins and outs of what you can and can't do on the Sabbath, how far you can walk, and, and, and what you can do here, what you can do there. And they're coming to measure Jesus' teachings. Hence, their skepticism. Because they know and they believe what's spelled out to us in the passage. I want to challenge you with this. What is their belief? What are these scribes and Pharisees absolutely convinced of that the Bible says and the Bible teaches? They are absolutely convinced that there is no human being on the face of the earth that can forgive a person's sins. No human can do that. There's only one person that can forgive sins, and it is God alone. God only. So the question we have to ask ourselves today is, are they right? Or did they get it wrong? How you answer that question is how you're going to come to Jesus. What you're going to do with Him. Because this, this is a, an intersection. This is a crossroads. Either Jesus was a good teacher or He was something more. Either He was only a preacher, only a prophet, only a human, or He was something more. Were they right? Is it true that only God can forgive sins or... Can God give that authority to forgive sins to another human being? I don't know if you have family or friends. You're in a Baptist church today, but I don't know if you have family or friends that hail, you know, come from a Catholic background, but Catholicism has some doctrines that, that kind of cross some lines here about the forgiveness of sins. You know, it was, it was this uh, phrase from William Tetzel that, moved uh, you know, a man named Martin Luther to go nail his 95 theses, his 95 problems with the Pope, by the way, uh, to the door at Wittenberg. And this is what Tetzel, William Tetzel, was going around basically as you know, the, uh, the, 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 the salesman for, for the church to raise money for the coffers to build the next big cathedral because the Pope had squandered all the, all the monies in the coffers of the Catholic Church, and he sent out his salesman, William Tetzel, to go, uh, to go do something that was unheard of up to that point. Uh, you know, the Pope thought he had the authority to do this. And you know the story if you know the Reformation. The guy goes around selling what's called indulgences. And here was his slogan. Here was his catchphrase, right? Remember this from church history books. Um, Every coin in the coffer rings, another soul from purgatory springs. And that was what put Martin Luther over the edge. Why? Were the Pharisees and scribes right? Were the doctors of the law right? Is God the only one that can truly forgive you from your sins? Or can this be given to others? I'm convinced they were right on this point. I'm convinced that they knew the Bible enough to know that this is what God teaches, that no one can forgive sins but Him. Think about that the next time you go to a church, I use that term loosely, and you approach a little closet behind a curtain, and they tell you that if you go in and confess your sins, you can be forgiven of them. Just think about that. Who can forgive sins but God only? There is one mediator between God and man, that's the man, Christ Jesus. There is no other mediator that can do what Jesus does for this man. 
But again, to prove that he has power in the unseen realm, he demonstrates his authority in the realm of what they can see. He tells them the very purpose. He calls them out on, what reason ye? What's easier? Okay, we know the answer to the rhetorical question. It's so much easier to just look at somebody and say, hey, your sins are forgiven. I could stand up here and do that all day long. I won't because I don't want to get struck by lightning. But I could stand up here and do that all day long. And people could come before me and I could say, oh, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. I, I really don't have any authority to do anything about that other than just make them feel good about themselves. But if they come before me, now hear me well, I'm a pastor of a church. I read and study the Bible. I tell people about Jesus. And I'm telling you that if, if you were to come to me today and say, Pastor, I need my sins forgiven. And if I were to look at you on my merit alone and tell you your sins are forgiven, you're going to leave that door with just as big a sin debt and guilt on you as you stood here with. And worse, I'm going to stand before God one day and give an account for that because I may have deceived you and misled you into thinking something that wasn't true and maybe even made you feel good about it. But when you stand before God and He calls that sin debt due and He checks the book of life and can't find your name written there, you will wake up in an eternity in a place called hell because your sins were never fully forgiven by God even though some man told you they were. So I think these guys are on to something here. They believe and are convinced that only God can forgive sins, and I think they're right. But Jesus tells them, you're missing the bigger picture. I want you to consider this idea of forgiveness, but not just any forgiveness. Specifically, the power that Jesus has to forgive sins. Why is that so important? I told you about it, but let me remind you. Because Jesus goes right to the root. The real problem that this man had was not necessarily his paralysis. It was a problem. It was a huge problem. It, it, it ravaged his whole life. The real problem, though, went deeper than that. Because when you understand the idea of sin, okay, this, this is another, uh, I don't, I'm out of time. <laughs> We've had so much, so much fun here today. Time flies when we're having fun. Uh, it's, I got to let you get to lunch, okay? But the Pharisees believe some things about sin. Jews in this day and time, they believe that a person could sin before they were born. Like in their mother's womb, they believed a person could sin and then be born with a malady. John chapter 9, that's the classic case, right? The man that was born blind. They say, who did sin? Even his disciples ask him this. Who did sin, this man or, or his parents, that he was born blind? Because they believed that you could sin in the womb and, and, and have consequences of that in your life. So when, they, when the friends bring this man taken with a palsy, the Pharisees in their mind are convinced that this guy is as wicked of a sinner as anybody could ever be, that he had to do something to deserve this. Can I just vouch for him and say, Luke doesn't tell us that he deserved this. Luke doesn't say he did anything to deserve this malady. We don't know how long he suffered with it. We don't know if he was born with it or if it came on him later. We just know that somewhere along the line, this is a paralysis that took his life and he couldn't do anything about it. And we're not given those other details on purpose because the real point here is that Jesus can not only heal his paralysis. Jesus uses the physical to point to something deeper, something spiritual that is in every one of us that we too suffer paralysis from, not physical paralysis. But can I tell you, if you're not saved today, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you are paralyzed. Every one of us is paralyzed. Spiritually speaking, we are paralyzed. We are helpless within ourselves to be able to come to God on our own. We're dead and trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2.1. There's nothing you can do about your situation. You're born into sin. You have the mark of Adam on you, and you're a sinner by choice. You're a sinner by nature. And given the chance to turn your back on God, like every other human being that's fallen on the face of this planet would, we do. We think wrong thoughts about Him. We go away from Him, prone to wander. 
Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Just like this man in his physical paralysis, you have to see you're spiritually paralyzed. There is no way that you will have eternal life. There is no way that you can have hope of peace and joy. There is no way that you will ever face anything in your existence but destruction. You are doomed. You are doomed by your sin to live a life confined in spiritual paralysis, far away from God, far away from His joy, far away from the life that He wants you to have. But your sin is between you and Him. And your sin will keep you in the spiritual bed of paralysis until you wake up in eternity and have to pay for that sin for all eternity because you never found the remedy this side of heaven. You never found the remedy this side of eternity. And that remedy is staring us in the face today. That remedy is in chapter 5 and verse number 20. That remedy is where Jesus told this man, not rise and walk yet. He told him, the greater need is thy sins are forgiven. Thy sins are forgiven. What will you do with Jesus? I've exhausted the time I have with you this morning, but I plead with you. Do not leave here the way you came. Now, you may have to leave with the same (laughs) ache in your back that you came in with. I'm going to walk out and I'm going to have that same ache in my back that I had when I was going up the side of that hill trying to summit that pass. And I feel it right now. But I'm telling you, there is a greater need that you have And that need is to be forgiven of your sins. Not the sins of the person sitting next to you on either side. Your sins. The sins that are separating between you and God. The sins that have hid His face from you that He will not hear you. Not that He cannot hear, but that He will not. If I regard iniquity in my heart, He will not hear me. If you keep regarding this, if you keep giving deference to this sin in your life, you will stand before God and give an account one day and He will weigh your life, and you will be weighed in the balances and found wanting. I hope that right now, this moment, you look and see the handwriting on the wall, because I don't know how long we have. There's something even greater in this passage, but I can't get to it. I'm going to have to maybe come back next week, because I want you to see where this whole thing is headed. We've only talked about the problem here today. We have yet to see the hope and the grace that what Jesus says to this man does as he promises something that only God can deliver. I want you to get your sin settled today. Your sin, thy sins, singular, not anybody else's. I want you to make sure that your sins are under the blood today because Jesus has a greater plan and purpose that he's working to bring this world to redemption. And He's coming again one day. The same Jesus that told this man, Rise, take up thy couch, and go to thy house. The same Jesus is coming again. And Hebrews 9.28 tells us, And to those who look for Him shall He appear the second time, listen, the second time, without sin, unto salvation.